Okay, it's four. Let's go ahead and get started. So we are going to start a topic that uh, that I is very near and dear to myself, I suppose. Integral equations in the method of moments. Um, and this is the next chapter in your book that we're going to study. Your book only includes some two-dimensional stuff, and it briefly describes what a three-dimensional integral equation looks like, but it goes into no depth at all about how to solve it and um, what kind of basis functions you might use in 3D and uh, you know how to incorporate geometries that are arbitrarily shaped, for example. It goes into no detail about how to incorporate impedance sheets or different kinds of boundary conditions that integral equations are constructed around, except for the perfect electric conductor. And uh, it, it goes into no depth about how to incorporate dielectric materials. It only talks about conducting PEC strips in two dimensions and, um, and also, uh, I believe, in like 1D one, one kind of geometry. Uh, so two, two dimensional electromagnetics problems, but one dimensional geometry. If you think of it that way, it's infinite in and out of the board, it's finite in one other dimension and has no, no thickness. <laughs> okay, we're gonna go into all of that though in, in our course. So we're gonna go above and beyond what the book has. And I think it's very useful for you to learn this method because um, as we'll see on the first slide of this lecture, that uh, and whenever you wanna solve a scattering problem in electromagnetics, you have to know the induced current, right? So maybe what we should do is, is jump right into it. So approaches that we learned so far to compute scattering, right? Uh, to compute the scattered field from objects, from objects illuminated. So I guess I wrote objects twice here, but to compute the scattered field from illuminated objects, we must use the vector potential integral. And we don't have to say must, but we can, can use the vector potential integral, right? <laughs> the vector potential integral we learned last semester. We have the magnetic vector potential at some observation point R is equal to mu over four pi times the volume integral of j, the current density, multiplied by the Green's function. So this is a spatial convolution of the, green, of the current density against the kernel, which is the Green's function, right? E to the minus j beta r over r, where r is the distance between the source and observation points, right? Okay, and once we have a, we can calculate h directly from a by taking the curl, and then we can calculate e directly from a by following this formula here, right? All right. But however, to use this approach, we need to know the current density. So that's the problem. Uh, we've learned a couple of approaches to obtain this current density for a given geometry and illumination. Well, we studied several ways to compute the scattering if we had the current density or how to approximate it. One is physical optics. We learned this last semester. The physical optics current density is N cross H, right? Where H is composed of H1 and H scattered. We're assuming this is a conductive obstacle. And we can approximate this conducting obstacle as being locally flat, infinite, and planar, or locally infinite and planar. And therefore, the H1 is equal to, the incident is equal to the scatter, right? So you get 2n cross h i, basically, right? Okay. We learned equivalence theorems, so we can approximate or we can obtain currents. If we know fields in some region, then we can calculate uh, equivalent current densities j and m existing on some kind of surface that's encapsulating uh, either the source region or, or uh, separating the source region from another region of interest, right? Okay, or we learned about mode matching. In mode matching, we don't necessarily need the current. We expand the fields in two different regions in terms of wave functions that are appropriate for the boundary conditions that we need to apply or the coordinate system, therefore, that we're going to use. And we apply boundary conditions to find the unknown coefficients. All right, we did that last semester as well. Or we can approximate via hypothesis. We know that we have a linear antenna and we have a you know, finite wire that the current must go to zero at the ends. Then we can approximate the current on an antenna using uh, maybe a sinusoid, right? Where it's maximum at the center and it goes to zero at both ends. So these are the four ways we kind of learned how to approximate current densities up into this point, right? All right. But what if we need, or what if we have an arbitrary structure that's arbitrarily shaped it might be finite in dimension. We might not know a good way to approximate the current density a priori, right? We might need to solve for it. So how would you use the methods on the last slide to obtain or estimate the current on a more complex object? For example, this um, military sea craft, for example. 
This is sort of a PEC model or a CAD model of a military AC craft. And here what we've done is represented in terms of a triangular mesh. And then we've ran the method of moments algorithm in order to calculate the induced current given a normally incident unit strength plane wave and obtain these currents on this scale, right? So this is a very difficult or a complex object. It'd be very difficult to approximate or come up with a good guess for the current density on that, on that structure, right? So um, we would need more, more robust numerical algorithms to calculate what the current density would be on a complex object like that, right? Okay, we're gonna learn this, to, we're gonna learn that approach in this lecture. So I start off with, oh, I forgot there's animations here. Okay, so I start off with a uh, question for you guys. Say I have a PEC rectangular plate. That's dimension L by W, it's infinitely thin. It's a PEC flat rectangular sheet. And there's an incident plane wave that illuminates this sheet, right? So my question, and this plane wave is normally incident. My question to you is, what is, what field drives the current at this point? What do you think? What's that? Okay, so later on we're going to learn an algorithm called geometrical optics and geometrical theory of diffraction, which is uh, which would use a local approximation to geometry in order to calculate what the induced current would be at that point or the field that drives that current. But in this case, we're going to rigorously account for all the coupling and the scattering and self-scattering and so forth that we're going to learn about. So. Uh, so maybe not just the local point, but what else? What do you think? Yes. So that's a physical optics approximation, which is also local, right? Locally, the current at this point is only dependent on the incident magnetic field, which is which is uh, evaluated at that point, right? Sure. It's affected by the induced current at every other point. Very nice. That's right. So it's not just the incident plane wave, but the current that's induced at all other points on the scatterer are also radiating themselves and they radiate an electric field to this point, right? So the incident field drives current at this point, but also the radiated field due to all other currents on the plate, even this one here, they all radiate electric fields. You have to sum up the electric field due to all other portions of the plate in order to find the exact field that drives current at that point, right? So what does that look like? So the total electric field, we can say, is equal to E incident. And OK, so the current at that point itself, right? So let's say we have a total field that induces current here. That current re-radiates onto itself, itself coupling at other parts of the structure very close by, right? So a current here, if you drive a current here, then that current's going to radiate, and it's also going to couple back onto itself. That's called, and alter the electric field there that's driving the current, right? That's called the self-scattering, self right? Uh, so the total electric field at that point is the incident field plus the self-scattering plus the electric field due to all other neighbors on the entire plate, right? Okay. So we can write the the uh, incident, we can write this total electric field as E incident minus J omega mu times the integral of G dotted with J. This is the current at all other points on the plate at R prime, every other, every other point on the plate, R prime. And the Green's function, which we'll learn about, links radiation, links the electric field due to a current at R prime, the electric field at point R, observation point R, due to a current at R prime. All right, we'll learn. I mean, we've seen it before, but we're going to understand in this context. Yeah, so it's a dyadic Green's function. We'll learn about that. Uh, yeah, we will learn about this. So it's just a matrix which collects responses and excitations. For example, GXX, GXY, GXZ, GYX, GYY, GYZ, G Z, X, Z, Y, Z, Z is the Green's function tensor, the dyadic. All right, so this Green's function dyadic, take the first index is the source, source component, right? The current density component, for example. 
And the second index is, I guess I should have said the inner index, right? The first index is the observation component and the second index is the source component. So this, this uh, element of the dyadic Green's function links or gives you the X component of the electric field at observation point R due to the Z component of a current density at position R prime. All right, don't worry about the tensor notation for now. It's just an introduction. Anyhow, this is how you calculate the scattered field, right? So the scattered field we're saying consists of self plus neighbor, all right? The vector potential kind of thing. All right, good. Okay. So I've repeated the equation here. We have the total electric field is equal to E incident minus J omega mu times the integral of G dot with J. We integrate over the area of the plate, all right? So we generally know the left-hand side, E total, the left-hand side, we know due to a boundary condition, E total equal to zero for PEC, or E total is equal to Z into J for an impedance sheet, for example, right? We know the excitation. We know the illumination. We know the Green's function. We're assuming we know the Green's function. The only unknown in this equation is the uh, current density that appears underneath the integral sign in the integrand, right? So just like a differential equation is an equality that relates an unknown function to its derivatives, an integral equation is an equation relating an unknown function to its integral value. So this is some equality, right? There is a J that satisfies this equation. Everything is known except for the unknown current density in the integrand, right? Okay, so this is called an integral equation, and there are ways to solve these. So we'll do like a quick overview of what you would do to solve it, and then we'll get into a more concrete example. So here's the integral equation again. And since we do not know the functional form of this current density, right? We don't know the current density. That's the unknown. What we can do is expand it into a series of known functions with unknown coefficients. So what we can, for one, one example, one approach, is to break this PEC plate into a grid, right? And we can assign what's called the pulse basis function to each unit cell of that grid, which has dimensions delta x by delta y and height alpha. And by assigning different alphas, or we'll solve for the different alphas, that we would scale each of these pulse basis functions by to get sort of a stair-step approximation to the current density on that plate. All right? So to illustrate this point, we'll assume that the current is constant within each cell, the so-called pulse basis function. All right? For this particular 3D problem, we will see that this is a bad choice of expansion functions as they, as, as they lead to accumulation of charge at the interface between expansion functions, but we'll worry about that later. So the idea is to expand our unknown current density into a weighted superposition of known basis functions. We couldn't do this integral, right? We cannot do this integral because we don't know J, that's what we're trying to solve for. But if I represent my current density on the entire plate in this form, then I can substitute that in for J, right? If I substitute this in for J, then what all I get is an integral I can solve because I know what F are, right? And because of linearity, I can factor out these unknown coefficients from the integral. So what I end up with is an equation I can solve. I can solve this integral here, right? Uh, and, but there are unknown coefficients. But now the problem is there's n complex constant coefficients that are unknown. There are n total of them. And we only have one equation, right? So it's just a high level overview. We're gonna dig into more details in the following slides. So that's one of the problems here. We have this equation here that now we can solve it at least up to the unknown coefficient, but we only have uh, one equation in n unknowns, right? The n, n expansion functions, the coefficients rather. Okay. So this equation is valid at a single observation point R. So I've repeated the equation here. We don't know these n coefficients. We have one equation to solve. So one equation in n unknowns. We can solve this because we've chosen these basis functions to be known with unknown coefficients. All right? So this is valid at a single observation point R, this entire expression, this equality here. 
to generate n equations to solve for the n unknown complex constants now, we could evaluate this equation at n different observation points, right? So just evaluate this equation. We want to, we want to construct n total equations so we can solve for our n unknowns. And the way we do that is we evaluate this integral equation at n different points, making the system square, and then we can solve it. So solve for the unknown coefficients. So this is called point matching. We'll see this again later in this lecture. But uh, since we evaluate this equation, evaluating the equation means to enforce the boundary condition at the point of evaluation only. The boundary condition is only enforced at these n discrete points, right? Consequently, the current solve for can be inaccurate at, at the intermediate points. Yes? Can you give a summary of what the basis vectors are? Yeah, we'll get into that. So for now, there are known functions, right? What we were thinking of in this example is that we have uh, pulse basis functions. So they're equal to one, for example, and then the alpha that we saw for scales them. So we can have different heights, a different uh, stair step approximation, if you will, or homogeneous, piecewise homogeneous approximation to the current. So it's, it's uniform throughout its given domain of a pulse basis function. It's equal to one. So when you plug it into here, for example, this is just equal to one over this domain, right? So that drops off and we integrate the Green's function. Okay, so a more accurate approach would obviously be to average the equation over the domain of a small area near the point. So we'd average over the domain of the basis function and we'll see how to do that later on. But to do that, we introduce a testing or weighting function and perform a weighted average integral of the equation over the testing function's domain. So. Uh, in, at this point, what we do is we take that equation, which was E total equal to E incident uh, minus the sum of alpha n into J omega mu times the integral of G into F, right? But now what we're going to do is we're going to multiply both sides of the equation by a weighting function called Fm, and we're going to integrate over its domain. In this case, it could be pulses as well. So we're just averaging the electric, we're averaging this equation over this domain of this pulse basis function, all right? Okay, and we have to integrate over its domain. So doing that, we end up with a linear system of n equations and n unknowns that can be cast into matrix form and solved on a computer. So let's see how we would do that. This matrix we call the W matrix, which is the averaging of the electric field. It's a weighted average integral of the electric field, the total electric field uh, over the domain of each cell, right? Here we have the uh, weighted average of the incident electric field, and we call that the V vector. And then we have the impedance matrix Z, which is the integration of the Green's function against the, they call this the testing function and this the basis function, all right? So don't worry if we're, this is just supposed to be a very high level overview and we'll get into the details of a specific ex example, all right? And then we have the unknown coefficients that we need to solve for. So for a given m and n, where m is an index, we'll see an example, where m is an index to a particular testing function and n is the index to a particular basis function, we can calculate this impedance matrix. And for, this, for a particular index m, which is for the testing function, which is one of these pulses, right? Let me go back. The mth pulse could be this one and the nth pulse could be that one, and you just calculate the, you evaluate this matrix equation at the, or this integral equation at those uh, points. Yes? So is the pulse, the pulse basis function, is that what's called? Is that the F sub M? Yes, oh, okay. yes. So it would be equal to one over the domain of integration over its, it's equal to one over this domain and zero everywhere else. We'll see an example. They'll probably make it a lot more clear. So this is a high level overview. So. The linear system of n equations and n unknowns can be cast into a matrix form and solved on the computer. Once we can solve for these i n's, then we can go back to, this should really be alpha n's, right? We can go back to the current density expansions, and we can plug in these alphas, and we can approximate the current, the unknown current, all right? So here's a quick 1D example. Maybe this will help, uh, help you to understand it. So here we're picturing a PEC plate, which has finite width W. It's infinite in and out of the board. It exists along the x-axis, and the y-axis is normal to it. The electromagnetics problem is therefore two-dimensional, with the out-of-plane wave number, 
in and out of the board, kz equals to zero. All right, so it's infinite and invariant in and out of the board. We do that just to reduce the dimensionality and simplify the problem. So it's a PEC plate, right? It's being illuminated normally from above with a unit strength plane wave or a plane wave of strength E naught traveling along the negative Y axis. And it's polarized in and out of the board like this, Z hat. So the boundary condition on the PEC is N cross E total equal to zero, right? Tangential electric field has to go to zero. Or we could say EZ total equals to zero because the only component of the electric field which is tangential to this PEC plate is the Z component. Thus, the EFIE, the electric field integral equation, can be written like this. EZ incident, the left-hand side is EZ incident, right? The right, okay, so let's go back. Here's the integral equation. If E total, if E total is equal to zero, then this term goes away, right? So then we just have zero is equal to E incident, and then we integrate against its testing function or its weighted average integral, uh, is equal to E scattered, right? The right-hand side. Zero is equal to E incident uh, plus E scattered. Okay, so easy incident on this side then and easy scattered, negative easy scattered on this side. Okay, so look at here. If easy total, easy total, which is equal to E, Z incident plus E Z scattered has to equal to zero. Then we can say that E Z incident is equal to negative E Z scattered, right? And that means this part is E Z incident. This is negative E Z scattered. All right. Okay. So E Z incident is equal to eta times beta over four. Don't worry where that comes from right now. And the integral over minus W over two to W over two over the domain of this plate of j into the Green's function for two-dimensional problems. It's not e to the minus jkr over 4 pi r. It is h naught 2. You've seen the Hankel function before, h naught kind 2. And it's the radiation due to an infinite line source, right? OK, beta naught into x minus x prime. So that should not be there, this thing, OK? All right, so let's discretize the geometry first. Here's our integral equation. We've, we've derived the integral equation now. Let's discretize the geometry. In the simple case, we use five segments. So there are one, two, three, four, five segments here. And each xn will denote the center of each pulse basis function of width delta, of width delta, right? So there's x1, x2, x3, and x4. And these all define the centers. You can index them like this, right? OK, so let's expand our current density our unknown current density into these pulse basis functions, jz will equal to n equals to zero to four of alpha n times pn of x, where pn of x is equal to one if you're in the domain, right? So pn here says that if x prime, which this function has a definition for all x prime, if x prime is between x, so let's say this is one, x one minus delta over two, so x one is here, minus delta over two puts us there, or less than xn plus delta over 2 puts us here, right? So if x prime is in between these two bounds, then it will give you a value of 1. Everywhere else, it gives you a value of 0, right? Okay. All right, so the next step is to substitute that current density expansion into the integral equation. So here is our current density expansion. We substitute it into the integral equation for the unknown current density that we're trying to solve for. And then we factor out the unknown coefficients, right? Sorry, these are the unknown coefficients. We factor out the unknown coefficients. And we're left with an integral we can solve, right? Okay. Since the pulse is only non-zero over its domain, the integration from minus w over 2 to w over 2 can be changed to xn minus delta over 2 to xn plus delta over 2 because this pulse basis function in the integrand is only non-zero over that domain. Everywhere else, it gives you a result of zero, right? So now we're left with the, with the task of integrating this Hankel function. So let's use, so this is one equation and five unknowns. So let's use point matching to generate five equations. We will match at the centers of each segment. 
So look at this equation here. So this is, there really should be a, a x here, right? And here's the observation x. This is valid for any observation x. And here's the source coordinates. Remember, prime is source coordinates. Unprimed is observation coordinates. So this Green's function is essentially linking the electric field observed at point x due to a source at point x prime. Why are you using the vertical function? Well, okay, we'll get to that because it's a two-dimensional problem, right? So remember how, remember when we derived the, um, okay, here, sorry. Remember when we derived the Green's function for three-dimensional problems? What did we do? We solved the wave equation by replacing the right-hand side with the delta function and solving that, that wave equation, the differential equation. We obtained a solution which we call the Green's function. So the Green's function is the radiation due to a delta function, right? Mm -hmm. In this two-dimensional problem where the out-of-plane wave number is zero and the geometry is infinite in and out of the board, then the point source or the, the uh, delta function becomes an infinite line source in and out of the board because that point source has to also be invariant in and out of the board. So if you have a point source, it just becomes an infinite, infinitely long point source, which is a line source, right? So a line source, we know it radiates in H naught two. That's one way you can think of it, yeah? Okay. Oh, oh geez. Okay. So let's use point matching to evaluate this equation at five different points to solve for our five unknowns. So we'll call each of those points XM, where M goes from 0, 1, 2, 3 to 4. All right? So now we have five equations and five unknowns. All right, so here's our five integral equations, or our five, our five uh, evaluations of the same integral equation at the five different points, right, of observation. And we can rewrite this. Okay, let's use midpoint rule to evaluate the integrals here, just for a quick example. Midpoint rule means that we're going to evaluate the integrand at the center of the integration domain and multiply by the uh, width of the, uh, the uh, integration domain, right? So that means we evaluate this integrand at the center of the x prime at the center of this domain of integration, which we call xn, right? The xn's were the centers of the pulse basis functions, right? And we multiply by delta, which we're calling the, or, or which is the length of the integration domain, right? All right. Okay, good. So now this is a function of m and n, right? So we can build a matrix ZMN. We can get to we can do the um, the impedance matrix. We can build the impedance matrix by evaluating these at different m. So this is m and n, right? So we have H not two. So here's the impedance matrix part, which is um, this part here. This is all ZMN, right? So if we plug in zero, we're saying x zero and x zero, right? And if we go back to the discretization of the geometry, then uh, x0 is here. So we're talking about observing the electric field radiated by this pulse of current, right? This uniform pulse of current radiates, and we're going to observe it at the same point, at the center, right, of this pulse basis function. All right. And z12, for example, if we go to Z12, that means um, that we have 0 here and x equal to 1 here, right? And that means that the observation, we're observing at x0 pulse, and we're observing the electric field radiated by a pulse of current at x1. So if we go back here, there's a pulse of current here at x1 that's radiating, and we're observing it at this center point, right? That's what these Green's functions mean in this impedance matrix, and so forth, right? X naught, X2, X naught, X3, X naught, X4, and then we, we observe. So this one here is the integral equation observed, evaluated at the first observation point, right? On the first pulse at X0, observed, right? So we can call that X equals to X0. The second row here is 
x observation equals to x1. And this last one, for example, is x observation equals to x4. Each column here indicates which pulse is radiating, right? Which pulse, we're observing the electric field due to the pulse of current at x prime equals to zero. This one is x prime equal to one, or x one rather, and x zero. And this one is x prime equals to x four. All right, that's how this matrix is constructed. All right, the V matrix is nothing but observing the electric field at the center of each pulse. The left-hand side, right? It's the incident field. We're doing point matching here, so we're just observing this incident electric field at x0, x1, x2, x3, and x4. And remember, x0, x1, x2, x3, and x4 were nothing but the coordinates of the centers of each of these pulses, right? These coordinates. Okay. Now that we have Z and V, we have the full matrix equation, which is Vm equals to Zmn into In. Now to solve this, we just have to invert Zmn, the impedance matrix, and left multiply both sides by it. Yeah? Okay, good. Now, there is one problem, though, this Green's function. Green's functions are always singular when R is equal to R prime. Right when you observe at the same place that you that you radiate from, right, then uh, this function becomes singular because the Hankel function evaluated at the zero argument is infinite, right? So you got to deal with those. We'll come back to those later, but uh, just to bring it up to your attention that you have to treat these singular terms differently. That's the hardest part about method of moments and integral equations is dealing with these singular terms. There, there's one approach to do it here, but we'll come back to that, okay? Just know that you have to do that. Here's some quick code. This is all the code you need to, to solve this problem. So here we set up the a frequency, 10 gigahertz. We calculate lambda, k naught, eta naught. We say the width W of this PEC strip is lambda. There are, okay, so I set it to 100 to show you later when you add a lot, but our example had only five, right? Five. And we say the delta, right, that delta was the width of each of those pulses is equal to W, the plate width, divided by the number of cells. And the unit, the incident plane wave's amplitude is 1 volt per meter. We have this number here that we're going to need, gamma, which is equal to 1.781, which is Euler's constant. That comes from the small argument expansion of the Hankel function when you evaluate the self terms, the diagonal terms, all right? We'll come back to that later in the course. Uh, we define the discretization. This is that formula that I showed you before. X is equal to minus W over 2 plus delta over 2. So minus W over 2 puts you on the left end of the plate, plus delta over 2 puts you at the center of the first pulse. And then we, we move by delta to get to the next point all the way until we get to W over 2, the right end of the plate, minus half of the pulse width, right? And then we calculate the Y coordinates of the plates are all going to be zeros because the plate's at Y equal to zero. So we calculate the voltage vector first. V is equal to E naught times, this is the incident field, but evaluate it at X, XM and YM, each of the values of these vectors, X and Y. But because the plate's at Y equals to zero, then um, and there's no component of K incident, no X component of K incident, right? This, is an, this plane wave only is only dependent on Y. It's not dependent on X because it's e to the minus j k y. So this becomes, or this should be e to the plus j k y, right? That should be plus. So this should be a five, this should be plus. Uh, e to the plus j k y, but y is equal to zero, so the volt, the incident field is uniform across the um, PEC strip. So something happened with the, the font here, but what we do is we calculate the impedance matrix next. We loop for over m and n, so we start with the first pulse in the in the five pulse string that represents the current and we step we calculate uh we loop through each of the others right so we start with pulse number one then we go to pulse pulse one onto pulse one pulse one onto pulse two pulse one on pulse three pulse one on pulse four and so forth right and we loop over n if m is equal equal to n then that means it's the radiation at pulse one evaluated at pulse one so it's called a self term and to evaluate the self terms you have to do something different uh, we'll derive that formula later. If it's not a self-term, 
That means that we're not observing at the same pulse that we're radiating from. Then we calculate the impedance matrix as A to K over four times delta, which is the width of the integration domain, and evaluating the integrand at its center point, right? Which is the absolute value of Xm minus Xn, which gives you the distance between the source and observation point, right? The centers of those pulses. And we take the absolute value multiplied by K naught. Good. Now we can calculate the current by doing solving the matrix equation, Z inverse times V, and then we just plot the current, right? So here's, here's the result for that PEC plate. If N is equal to five only, and the plate has a width of lambda, then this is what we get for the induced current amplitude and angle and phase, right? So uh, the amplitude, it's a poor approximation to the current, right? The amplitude is the, the uh, blue curve. It's a poor approximation. And the phase is the red curve. So we can see we only get five points here. and We linearly connect those five points in this plot, right? But if we increase the current density, or sorry, if we increase the number of points to n equal to 100, then we see we get a much better approximation or a much better solution for the current. So the current has these singularities. The amplitude increases at the ends of the plate. And the uh, phase it starts at zero, you know, at near the center of the plate, and then it decays when you get closer to the uh, ends of the plate. All right. We can calculate the physical optics current density. What would the physical optics current density look like for this plate? Yeah. Two times H incident, right? So 2N cross H incident. And we know the normal is Y. The magnetic field is an X, so we get Z. And 2 E naught, because we know the incident electric field is just E naught when Y is equal to zero. And you divide that by eta to get the magnetic field. And the two comes from this 2N cross H I. So we get 5.3 milliamps per meter. What does it look like on the plot? It will be like a perfect square root. Perfectly, yes. It's, it's a constant, right? So 5.3 milliamps is probably here, maybe. Uh, somewhere like this, right? So we see physical optics is an approximation to the actual current. Physical optics does not model this edge, this edge effects here the finiteness of the plate, and it doesn't capture, what's the phase of the physical optics current? Zero, right? There's a real number. So the phase of the physical optics current is here. So physical optics is, obviously this is one lambda plate, so you wouldn't use physical optics here. Yeah. No, it depends on the polarization, right? So. If you have a plate like this, and your polarization is this direction, then the current has nowhere to go when it gets to the end of the metal. So it has to go to zero. It can't, be, it can't have current out here. So the current has to go to zero. So it looks something like this, right? But if you have polarization in and out of the board, then what happens actually is the current becomes singular like that. And it's because of the infinite amount of charge that you need to accumulate on these finite edges here. In order to satisfy the tangential boundary, the boundary condition of tangential E goes to zero. Well, yeah, so it's a singularity, right? So um, obviously it's a probably a countable singularity, but. Um, you have more charge on the edges, but it's not an infinite amount of charge. Yes, it's not exactly infinite, right? We classify it as a, a singularity that it blows up, right? It's a lot of charge. Okay, great. Good question, though. So All right. Is that why we normally use a tapered like blade incident? Like uh, for some problems, like the edge of this. Yeah. So if you have some some geometry that you're illuminating, like a reflector, for example, you don't want to illuminate the edges too strongly because we'll learn about this in the next lecture, in the next chapter. Um, you get a lot of edge diffraction, right? The edges interact with the incident field, and they scatter in all directions. So uh, that can corrupt your pattern. You don't want to uh, illuminate the edges too strongly. So sometimes people will taper the illumination so that they weakly illuminate the edges to reduce the edge diffraction. Uh, yeah, that's one reason why you can use a Gaussian beam. Uh, in the reflector case, it, there's actually more to it because you want to taper the feet so you don't or encounter anything called spillover. You don't want the power to spill past 
the reflector. You want to intercept most of the power with the reflector. Okay, so let's get into it a little bit more formally. So let's consider now an electric line source above a 2D finite width strip instead of a plane wave, a normally incident plane wave. So now we have a two-dimensional finite width strip. It still has width W. It still exists along the x-axis. The normal to the strip is y, and the z-axis is infinite, is in and out of the board. The geometry is invariant and infinite in and out of the board. But now we're illuminating it with a line source from above at a height h. The line source is also infinite in and out of the board and invariant. And we have the spherical cord, or sorry, the cylindrical coordinate system centered about. So there are two coordinate systems here, right? There is the y prime. This says y prime. There's the x prime here, which is centered on the strip. Then we have another coordinate system here, which is x and y, which is centered at the source, the illumination, right? The feed. Okay, so consider an infinite electric line source played to placed above a 2D conducting strip of finite width W. The line source in the absence of the strip radiates the field EZ direct, observed at some point rho. So if there's no strip, we can observe the electric field radiated by this infinite line source at some point rho, right? Uh, and that's nothing but A to K I Z over four times H naught two. This comes from last semester when we studied that in scattering chapter, right? Okay. The line source radiation intercepts the conducting strip and induces on it a conduction current density of Jz. It's in the z direction, right? In and out of the board times delta x prime is going to equal to delta iz of x prime. All right? So this is a current density, J, which is amps per meter squared. And we multiply it by the width of the strip, we get amps per meter. And in here, delta is going to be... Uh, I of Z is in amps, and then here delta will get a discretization, which will be per meter. All right? Okay. This current density radiates a scattered field denoted as EZ scattered. So the current density that's induced at each of these unit cells radiates its own electric field, right? We call that the scattered electric field. If the strip is subdivided into N segments, each of, the, each of with delta XN prime, like we did before. The scattered field can be written as EZ scattered is equal to minus A to K over four multiplied. And then this is nothing but the scattered field observed at a position rho, at an observation point rho, is equal to minus A to K over four multiplied by the Green's function and the sort of the uh, homogeneous approximation of the current density, right? So we take this current density J we multiply it by H naught two. This is nothing but the midpoint rule, essentially, right? All right, so that's equal to minus A to K over four, and we can plug in JZ here. If each of the line, in the limit as each segment becomes very small, we get the following integral, right? EZ scattered is equal to minus A to K over four. Uh, we integrate over the domain of the strip, H naught two, beta rn, where rn is the vector which connects to the distance, the length of the vector which connects the source to the observation point p. So this here is rn times diz. Okay? That's equal to minus a to k over 4, integral from minus w over 2, w over 2, which is integrating over the strip, jz into h naught 2. All right. Okay. So I've repeated the integral equation up here. The total field at any observation point, including the strip itself, will be the sum of the direct field and the scattered field. That's the total field, like we said at the beginning of the lecture. You have the incident field plus the scattered field due to other components on the same on the same strip, right? However, to determine the scattered field, we need to know the induced current density, right? So here's the integral equation, EZ scattered. No, this is not the integral equation yet. This is just how to find the scattered electric field. EZ scattered is minus A to K over 4, integration of the current density against the Green's function. So we need to know the induced current density, J. The objective here will then be to develop an equation that can be used to find the current density, right? We're going to construct an integral equation. This can be accomplished by choosing the observation point on the strip itself. 
At these points, we know what the sum of the direct and scatter field is due to the boundary condition on PEC. EZ total, where rho, the observation point, is on the strip itself, is equal to the direct, the total field is the direct plus the scatter field. That has to be equal to zero, right? So EZ scattered can be, can be related to EZ incident through a negative sign, right? EZ incident equal to negative, easy, or yeah, EZ scattered equal to negative EZ incident. So following from this boundary condition, we obtain EZ scattered. Here's the boundary condition again. We can express EZ scattered using this formula above. That's uh, here, right? This one is easy scattered and easy incident or easy direct is on the left hand side. All right. And we've negated. Okay, so we've negated the scattered. This one's kind of backwards, right? It would probably be better if this said scattered and this one said direct. Okay, good. So if the, if the, uh, line source that we're using to illuminate the PEC strip has a unit strength or a unit current, then this drops out. And then we have eta k over four and eta k over four on both sides. Those can all uh, be canceled. And we get the left-hand side is H naught two evaluated at points on the strip because that's what this boundary condition demands that we're on the strip is equal to minus the integral from minus W two to W over two of JZ into H naught two, right? Does the EFIE for the line source above the strip? Yeah? Okay. Um, think about the quantum radius of the deflection where we have, we're evaluating the self point at, with some other function. And then the Henkel function will drop off from it. Then there's going to be some uncertainty between where we're painting it there and where we're evaluating it. It's a different function at a finite point. Uh, say again, so we're evaluating the Henkel function. This distance is not zero, right? At least gonna, it can be zero, but it's going to be finite. Yeah, this will be finite unless it's a self term, which we still get a finite integral. But we'll, we'll, we'll deal with that later. So, are you saying how do we deal with the uh, uncertainty? Like, but between where we have the self point and the non self point. There's going to be some sort of uncertainty, but depending on how smaller distances. Yeah. So uh, to, whenever the uh, argument of the Henkel function goes to zero, then it starts to blow up, becomes infinite, right? But uh, if we know this non-zero result, uh, I, I don't know how to quantify the uncertainty. This this function is well known, right? So no matter what this distance is, we can evaluate this. If this distance is exactly zero, then uh, this function is singular, but you can integrate its integrable singularity. So uh, I'm not sure how to, what the quantification of the uncertainty would be, because the function is well known, right? Okay, good. So now we have to solve the integral equation. So the way we will do that is, um, to solve the integral equation, we first expand the unknown current density into a finite series of the form. So we have JZ of X prime is equal to the sum, we expand our unknown current density into known basis functions here with unknown coefficients, alpha n, and we sum them up from n equal to one to n, right? So it's the same thing as what we did back here. What we did back here was we broke this PEC strip into five segments, right? Each of those five segments, we assigned a single pulse basis function that was non-zero only over the segment's domain. We denoted the observation coordinates to be the center of those segments. So when we discretize the segment, we could point to the centers of each of those segments using this expression here, right? So we're doing the same thing here, except now the G of Ns are called basis or expansion functions. So we're not gonna pick a particular basis or expansion function, right? We're just going to call them GN of X for now. There are different choices of basis functions that we can use that give us, you know, more or less better, better or worse results or accuracy. So here we're just going to call them GN of X for now. They have unknown coefficients. And we substitute this expansion for the current density into our integral equation, which we 
couldn't solve before because we didn't know J, but now we substitute in a known expansion for J in terms of unknown coefficients and known basis functions, then we end up with this expression here, right? All right, now we can factor out the summation, the unknown coefficients, and we end up with H02 of beta rho M is equal to minus sum from N equal to one to N alpha N. And we have uh, this term here, minus W2 to W2 GN of X. So we're integrating now just the known expansion functions against the Green's function. This integral we can do, right? So uh, once we choose the GN of X, but those are known functions. So in principle, we can do this integral. All right, and we can write this as H, the left-hand side we can call H. We can reproduce this summation of alpha N, and then this term, the integral itself, we're gonna call uh, F of G of N, right? It's a function of G of N. So F is here. F is a function of G of N. It depends on the choice of basis functions that we use. And we integrate that against this Hankel function H naught two, all right? So by nature of us applying the boundary condition on the PEC strip, remember that rho had to equal to rho M, where that's some point, the mth point on the PEC strip, and we had to evaluate it on the PEC strip, right? This should probably say strip, I think. Let me clear this up. So this should be strip, right? So on the strip itself. So that means rho is equal to rho M. At this point, we picked up a rho M to put us on the strip, right? Okay, good. All right, so we have f of g of n is equal to minus the integral from w over two to w over two times g of n. So once we pick a basis function, then we can evaluate this integral operator. It's a linear integral operator, that's what we call it. And g of n represents the response function, right? Whatever we choose for g of n, we call that the response function, it's the basis functions. And h is the known excitation function. Right? Okay. All right, so the integral equation derived by enforcing the boundary condition on the PEC strip, E tangential equal to zero to observation points, rho equal to rho m is repeated here. H naught two at beta rho m is equal to minus the integral, or sorry, minus the summation of a n multiplied by this integral from minus w to w to g n h naught two, right? So this is one equation with n unknowns. So we can evaluate this at m equal to n points, right? We do the same thing. To generate n equations, we can enforce the equation at n different points where the boundary condition can be enforced. So the left-hand side, we call the voltage vector, Vm. We evaluate the left-hand side, which is typically the incident field, at m different points on the PEC strip. Those m points were evaluating the boundary condition. That's equal to i into z, where the impedance matrix is the integral of h naught 2 into g n of x, right? Once we pick a g n of x, we can solve this. And we evaluate that at m different observation points, where m goes from 1 to, n, 1 to n. And we integrate over the domain of each of these pulse basis functions, whatever the domain of g n of x is, whenever we choose those, right? And then we are left with unknown coefficients. So we can convert this integral equation into a matrix equation, which we can solve on the computer as Vm is equal to the summation from n equal to one to n, i n times z m n, right? All right, so we can also write that in this notation where Vm equals to z m n times i n. Then we can solve it by inverting this impedance matrix and multiplying the left-hand side of bo both, the, by left multiplying both hand sides of this equation by it, right? All right, so we get i n. Since the boundary condition was enforced at only discrete points, n of them, then this, e this equation is only true at those n points, right? In between those points, the equation is not true. You won't get E total equal to zero when you're not on row M, right? Okay, so this approach we call point matching or co-location. We still have not defined the basis functions G of N of X prime concretely. We will do that next, all right? Yes. This is the whole because using that R is what R on first place. Okay, so this is third when the self is the thing. No, no. Can you go? You mean here? Um, 
Yeah, so, um... Sorry, let me just clean this up a little. So how do we get a full matrix equation from this, right? I know there's this, but uh, maybe in the line source problem, in the line source case, and you define the uh, E total equal to zero and then E B equal to E S. Like I'm sorry. One one more time. Um, can you explain the line source? Yes. Okay. So, uh, can you go to that slide and show it to me? Here. Yeah. Next one. Okay. Yeah. So here, using that easy total when rho is equal to rho m is zero. E z total when rho equals to rho m is equal to zero. That's correct. That's the boundary condition for perfect electric conductor. Okay. And then you continue it from here. So, but we need other rho. Yeah. So, okay. So, okay. So let's back up then since it might be confusing. So here is the line source, right? Illuminating this PEC strip. Let's assume that's infinitely thin for now, right? So... The, the line source radiates this electric field. We know that from last lecture, right? So this is the incident field evaluated at any row, but it would be the row in this coordinate system, right? Here's row in the feed zone coordinate system, right? Okay. Now, but that feed also radiates onto this source distribution or this PEC plate, right? Okay. So to find, th that will induce some current, the line source radiation onto that PEC plate, right? Those currents themselves will radiate a scattered field, yeah? Because it's a current density. So that scattered field is given by this integral right here, right? The scattered field is equal to uh, the Green's function multiplied by the current density, right? Or this one's probably better here, sorry. This one's better here. The Green's function multiplied by the current density. If this was e to the minus jkr over 4 pi r, you'd probably recognize this a little bit easier, right? But this is the current density. This is the vector potential kind of thing. Right, so we integrate j into g, or j into e to the minus jkr over four by r, but in this case it's two d, so j into h naught two, right? So this current density will radiate uh, an electric field at observation point rho due to the source, which is existent at all observation points rho prime. All right, so that's a scatter field, but the boundary condition here on this PEC strip is that e total has to go to zero, right? So if we go to the next slide, e total equal to zero. Here's EZ total, right? This has to equal to zero whenever, oh my goodness, whenever you're observing on the strip, right? So anytime rho, which is equal to rho m, the discrete observation, the m discrete observation points that are evaluated on the strip has to be zero, right? The total field, tangential E has to be zero. Okay, I thought you just considered the self effect of each Strip. No, you got to use all of them, right? So this, so here's the boundary condition, easy total, which is equal to easy incident, basically, plus easy scattered, right? But these have to be evaluated at these M discrete points, which are on the strip. The total field then has to be zero, right? Since the total field has to be zero, we can say that easy scattered is equal to negative easy incident. Yeah? Okay, very good. So from that boundary condition, I could substitute in what is easy scattered? Easy scattered we found to be this expression here, right? And what is easy incident? Easy incident we found to be this expression, the radiation due to a line source. So if you equate those two, you get this expression here. But this is evaluated at all m of the, or the nth observation point, right? Okay. But for each of those observation points, so if I have a strip like this, the electric field here at this x0 observation point, or xm equals to x0, is due to the current on the entire plate, right? That's why x prime varies from minus w over 2 to w over 2. The whole, the current on the entire plate contributes to the electric field at any given point, right? So you sum up the radiation due to all of that current at some observation point here. Okay, very good. Uh, so that means this integral equation here is, is valid at any row n. Now, this is one equation here 
but we haven't substituted in the current yet, right? So let's do that next. So we substituted in the current as an expansion. The problem with this expression here is we do not know this current. We want to solve for it. It's in the integrand. So we expand it in terms of a series of known functions, gn of x, weighted by some unknown coefficients, alpha n. By nature of the linearity of the problem, we can substitute in this j of this approximation in terms of an expansion of known basis functions into the integrand. And by nature of the linearity, we can pull out the coefficients. So now we have some kind of integral that we can solve, given that we knew what g was. And we know what the left-hand side is. We can evaluate. So the problem here is we have one equation and n unknowns. But now we can evaluate this at n different points on the scatterer. By doing that, we construct a matrix equation, which is very similar to uh, this one, right? So here, I have a strip like this. I have one, two, three, four, five, for example. This term here is nothing but the rate. Okay, let's not do that term. I'll come back to that term because it's a self term. This term here, for example, is the field observed here at the center of that pulse due to x2, which is this point, right? x2. So I integrate from minus x2 minus delta over 2 to x2 plus delta over 2, right? This is not minus, it's plus. Uh, and the pulse basis function has a unit strength there against the, so basically the j there, but it, the j had x not minus x2, right? dx. So the radiation due to this entire current element observed at this point, but not the whole strip, right? Just that current element is what this one is. Then the next one here is the radiation observed from this current strip onto this point. And this term is the radiation due to this uh, pulse basis function worth of current at this point. And then this one is obviously this one. And then this one is nothing but the radiation due to itself, back onto parts of itself, right? So basically what I've succeeded in doing with this entire row integrating the current across the entire strip and observing or adding up the field due to that current at this point. Yeah. So, and that's exactly what this is, right? When you, when you add, when you integrate or when you sum over n equals zero to four. Yeah. Okay. And then you do that for the next pulse. So we have one, two, three, four, five. Then we use this observation point. This element here is this current observed here. Then this element here is this current observed here. This one is this current observed there. This one is this current observed there. And then this one is itself, current radiated back onto itself. All right, and so forth, right? So you build the entire matrix like that. Okay. Okay, so. All right. So we haven't picked a, a G of X yet, right? So if this is our integral equation for the strip. And now we're going to uh, substitute in, or we're going to rewrite this in terms of a matrix equation, right? Given that we knew what the gn of x were, if we, if we pick some gn of x's, where there are many different choices, we'll look at them next. But if you knew gn of, GN of x, then you would be able to evaluate zmn, right? Because this is a known function, and the Hankel function is a known function, and you can do this integral in principle, right? So you can calculate, and what is this integral a function of? Indices m and n, because... You have to choose the nth basis function, the radiation due to the nth basis function current observed at the nth observation point, right? Okay, so you can do this for all combinations of m and n, and that means you get a square matrix here, right? All right, then we have the voltage vector here where we just observe the incident field at the m observation points, and we have the uh, unknown coefficients in a vector i that we're going to solve for, right? So we get this matrix equation here. And we can solve that matrix equation for the INs. So we call this point matching a co-location. And since we have not defined the basis function concretely, we'll do that next, yeah? OK, good. So what kind of basis functions can we use for gn of x? There are many different kinds of basis functions, right? There are two different classes. There are subdomain basis functions. And there are entire domain basis functions. Subdomain basis functions are the ones we've been looking at so far, where they only span a subdomain of the entire domain of the problem, right? 
if the strip was minus w over two to w over two, it had a width of w, but the basis functions each had a subdomain of that, right? From xn minus delta over two to xn plus delta over two. So they only spanned part of the entire scatter. Those are called subdomain basis functions. They're much more general and versatile. Uh, then in contrast, there's entire domain basis functions. For example, we could have, instead of expanding the current <coughs> in terms of a weighted superposition of, uh, so z hat, for example, a n times p n of x prime, right? Uh, where p n of x prime, oh, it's down here, right? And where p n of x prime is existed only over its subdomain. So here we have a pulse basis function, which is equal to one between x prime, between x n minus one and x n. So here's x n minus one and x n for n equal for g two. Um, it's equal to one, right? Why is it equal to one? Because when we solve for the coefficients of i, we can multiply that i by this pulse basis function of one, and we get approximation due to the current. For example, here. So here's all of the g ones of x's. All the g ones of x's are or g of x's are unit strength to start off with, right? When we build up this matrix equation here, these are all unit strength. Then they get scaled by the alphas that we solve for. Right? So when you go back here to reconstruct or to construct the current, we have alpha one, alpha two, alpha three multiplied by G1. Let me let me write that out so you can see it. Al uh A1 G1 of X prime, A2 G2 of X prime, A3 G3 of X prime is what these say. That one, this one, and this one. All right. So the current then looks like it starts out at a lower value and increases to a larger value as, it, as you traverse around the strip along the x prime direction, right? Okay, so the alpha one is less than alpha two, which is less than alpha three. So the alphas scale the basis functions in order to create a approximation to the current. When we expand to J in terms of weighted superposition of pulse basis functions with unknown coefficients, this is exactly what we were saying. The current is constant over the domain of the pulse but it's scaled by the coefficient that we solve for, right? So that's the approximation that we use with these pulse basis functions. So here, this thing says the sum over n of a n g n of x prime is the current now, right? So the best we could do with pulse basis functions is constant over the domain, and then it changes, right? So it's like a piecewise homogeneous approximation to the current with pulse basis functions. We could also use what are called triangular basis functions. So a triangular basis function starts out at zero at the left end of its domain. It increases linearly to the value of one at the center of its domain. And then it decreases linearly back to zero at the right end of its domain. The three-dimensional basis functions, which are called Rowland Glisson, RWG, are these functions implemented on a triangular domain. All right, they're linear basis functions. So now the alphas are going to scale each of these triangles. When we solve for the alphas by solving the matrix equation, we end up getting scaled triangles, right? So for example, here's the first triangle. So the alpha, alpha one multiplied the unit height triangle. And then alpha two is here. And alpha three is here, right? So what are we getting when we use triangles? We're getting a linear approximation to the current rather than a piecewise constant, right? So here we get piecewise constant approximation to the current. Here we get a linear interpolation of the current, right? So it's a little better, yeah? You can also use what are called sinusoidal basis functions that are also subdomain. The sinusoidal basis functions are half sinusoids that start from the left end of the domain to the right end of the domain, and they have a unit strength as well. When you when you solve the integral equation, you end up with the a's. You, then you can scale each of these sinusoidal basis functions by the respective a's, and you get uh, a sinusoidal approximation to the current, where you sort of interpolate between the peaks, but in a curvilinear way, right? So these are constant, these are linear, and these are somewhat curvilinear, right? Kind of second order kind of things, right? Approximation is the current.
there any meaning to sort of aggregate the different basis functions and have some sort of filtered niceness continuous curve? Uh, are you saying something that has more of like a like, at the end, the current at the end? Like, like mix the different basis functions together and get some sort of smooth. Uh, you don't want to mix the basis functions, right? That's going to introduce some kind of. I, I haven't thought about that. Typically, that's not done. Okay. You don't mix the basis functions, but um, I, I suppose in principle you could. I don't know what that would what you would gain out of that though. Uh, I suppose you could though, right? Your expansion function, when you expand the current, J. Are we calling the GN? Yeah. Say again. I mean, uh, for the edges, we can use different basis function, maybe? I don't know. Uh, that I have not seen done either. In principle, though, you're expanding your current density in terms of whatever set you want to choose here, right? GN could be any set you want. They could be mixed, I suppose. But um, that's typically not done. Maybe there's a cleverer reason to do that, though, and you could come up with something interesting, right? Okay. Uh, on the top of function, but you blend the two basis functions together, depending on how close the edge you are. So it will sort of interpolate. Yeah, 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 possibly. Very good. So the other class is called entire domain. Let me just say something about those. So let's say we have the strip of finite width W. And instead of breaking this thing into pulses of subdomain functions, like we've been doing, instead, we can take this pulse of finite width W, and we can approximate the current or expand the current in terms of trigonometric functions, for example. Constant, then we could have uh, the half sinusoid, the full sinusoid. Uh, that's not a good full sinusoid, but uh, the one like this, right? So you can expand, you can expand the, the entire current, whatever function you expect the current to be, uh, j of x, right, over the whole domain. We can expand that into a Fourier series, for example, and we could solve for the coefficients using this. And these would be differing sinusoids of integral period, right? So that's one other approach. Okay, so this is supposed to be a high-level introduction to uh, metro moments and integral equations. We're going to come back and study it in a little bit more depth next lecture, but at least you get the idea, right? The idea is we have an integral equation that we constructed by enforcing a boundary condition with a known incident field and the scattered field ex expressed as a spatial convolution of an unknown current density and a Green's function, right? We don't know the current density. It's in the integrand. So we want to solve for it. How can we do that? We can expand the current density into a uh, weighted combination of basis functions. You plug those into the integral equation, you can pull out the coefficients, and you end up with integrals you can solve. You can convert that matrix then into a matrix system, matrix equation, n by n matrix equation to solve for the n unknowns that you expanded the current in terms of by enforcing that integral equation at n different points, the boundary condition at n different points. Then you just solve the matrix equation. Then you get the coefficients. Once you have those coefficients, you go back in and weight each of your basis functions by those coefficients, and you come up with your solution for your current which is an approximate solution, right? It's easy, right? I mean, we had a couple of lines of code here to do, you know, the my hello world type of integral equation or method of moments. Uh, it's just this much lines of code, right? But it's so powerful. Now you can take any geometry that you can think of and you can illuminate it with uh, whatever field you want, like this, for example and you can calculate the current, right? The actual current, the true current on this thing. Once you have the current on the surface, then you can find the radiated electric and magnetic field anywhere, because the current is all you need. Remember, when we, solved the, uh, when we solved the inhomogeneous wave equation using vector potentials, we needed the current as the input. Then we just use vector potential, we calculate B and E, taking the curl of A and so forth, right? Okay, good. Hopefully, uh, we'll, we'll dig into it a little bit more next time. So it should just be an introduction, something that you, you just now see for the first time, right? Or, or whatever. Made out of dielectric. What's that? What if the boat's made out of dielectric? Yeah, so that's, that's a more difficult problem. We'll go into that. We're going to study that for sure.
Dielectrics are a lot harder to treat than perfect conductors, but because they're penetrable, right? Yeah. So there are fields inside. Uh, but we will, we will, we will treat that. All right. Good. All right, guys. See ya.